But just to start off, I have a little bit of an accent, um, and I'm also jet lagged, and I also have a cold. <laughs> so if at any point you have any trouble understanding me, just give me the, the symbol to let me know you can't hear what I'm saying. Okay, so we're going to start off today talking about this. This is something which is um, a passion of mine. I spend a lot of time working in the technology industry. Um, and the one thing that seems to be prevalent in a lot of people, myself included, is a tendency to shy away from saying these three words, I don't know. So we're going to talk today about some theories that I have on why that's the case. We're going to talk about some of the ways we can say it, which actually continue the conversation as opposed to stopping it. And hopefully we're going to share some stories. I'm going to share some of my stories and hopefully you guys are going to share some of yours. Because it's 3.30 on a Friday, on the last day of a conference. So I don't know about you, but my energy levels are starting to go down a little bit. And I don't want to stand here for 40 minutes and uh, lecture at you. I want this to be a bit more interactive. So I need my red bull and I need you guys to help. Okay, so who am I? I shouldn't look down while I talk, I just got very loud. Who am I? So, I've been writing code since I was about eight years old. Um, I started using ZX Spectrums. Then we used the ZX Spectrum. Yeah. So, Z ZX Spectrums were amazing pieces of technology. Um, you plug them into your television. This is back before computer monitors were invented. So, they plugged in using the aerial cable into your mother's television, and that's how you used to write code. Uh, Code became a, a passion for me, it became a hobby, and it eventually became my career. So I started writing code for a job. Um, for various reasons of working for small startups, I ended up running technical teams quite early in my career and made a lot of mistakes. Um, being, being a leader is not something that came naturally to me, and I needed a lot of help and support in that. Um, and luckily for me, that's, that's what I got. Um, but because that I got all of that help and support in being a leader myself, I realized that a lot of people in the industry struggle with that. Um, it took me a long time to learn to be a really good leader, and I see this, the same thing happening in other parts of our industry. And so I founded the company, Pillar Leaders, which actually helps train technical leaders. So it helps people who are really, really good at what they do technically learn how to be really, really good leaders. Um, so it's all about taking some of that focus off the technology and putting some of that focus on the people in the business and spending time understanding that um, you know, the, the technology is great, but to build great products and to solve great problems, we need great leaders. And those leaders have to take a bit of a focus off, off the technology. Um, so that's me in, in a single slide. So, ooh, that just skipped about 10 slides forward. Okay, so um, I hate slides with quotes on them, but I really like some of these quotes. Um, does anybody recognize the, the bottom one? Does anybody know where that's from? Oh, one person, two people, anybody else? Yeah? Okay. Uh, who, who, who wants to say where it's from? Hitchhiker's Guys of the Galaxy. So um, whenever I see uh, quotes on the slides, I always think is that some way I can slip in a British sci-fi reference in there somewhere. Um, so this, this is my British sci-fi reference. The only reason why this slide is in here is because I, I just want to kind of highlight that this isn't something that's specific to technology. You know, not being able to say I don't know, not being able to admit um, that we have issues with saying these words isn't something that's specific to technology. It's something that a lot of other industries have trouble with. It's something that a lot of people have issues with for quite literally thousands of years. Um, so we're not special in this in technology, but I do think that there's certain things about the way that we hire people and certain things about the way that we structure um, promotions and um, recognition and reward in technology that make us more uh, prevalent to having these particular issues with saying the words I don't know. Um, does anybody remember the last time they wrote a CV? Um, 
and you, you're filling it out, and you put on there something like, I know Angular. I know Vue. You don't. You know a small part of that. You know a small part of Angular, you know a small part of Vue, you know a small part of React. There's no one person that knows everything that's in Angular. There's no one person that knows everything that's in Vue, except Ellen you. But this way of saying, I know X, what that means is, you go to the interview and you say, I know Angular. You get the job because you know Angular. And then some weird, obscure thing happens, which is the 90% of Angular that you don't know, you have to work on. And now you're in this weird place where you said you're an Angular expert. You interviewed saying you're an Angular expert. You got the job because you're an Angular expert. And you don't actually know all of it. And so you get this cognitive dissonance in your head that says, I don't want to say the words I don't know because I, I got this job because I said I did know. And I think this is, this is a huge problem in our particular industry because of the way that we interview and the way that we hire people. Um, and I think recruitment, any recruitment consultants in? Good. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think recruitment consultants have a lot to blame for this um, because you know, they, they uh, speak to the technical lead and they say, What's your ideal candidate? You know, what's your dream person for this job? And you, you know, they say they must have three years of Angular JS. So they must know Angular. You know, they, they must know this. They must know that. And so that goes out on the job advert. That's what gets put on the CVs, and that's what people say. So I blame recruitment consultants for a lot of what I'm about to talk about. As an aside. Um, Another big thing that I'm quite passionate about is diversity and inclusion. I was speaking to somebody earlier about this. See if they're here. No, they must be downstairs. They obviously already heard me talk about this, so they don't need to come for this talk. Um, saying, uh, when you structure your, your job adverts, one of the huge things that's a differentiator, when you look at all of the research, a huge differentiator between the way that men apply for positions and the way that women apply for positions is that Men are happy to apply for a position if they feel like they only meet about 70% of the requirements on the job advert. For women, that percentage tends to be significantly higher. And so this is actually leading into some gender diversity issues as well. So it's not just my talk. So I think it's this. I think the reason why we have a lot of problems in saying I don't know to people is basically our ego. Um, I think it's because you know, we're, we're kind of afraid of being caught out when we say I don't know to somebody. We're afraid of, of that little voice in our head that says maybe we're not as good as we thought we were. Um, but I'm really interested because I do a lot of work in Australia and you can probably tell from my accent that I'm not originally from Australia, I'm originally from the UK, so I did a lot of work in the UK as well. And I think this is the main reason why we have trouble saying I don't know. But I'm basing that purely on the work that I've done in the UK and Australia. So I just want to kind of check my research with people in this room. Does this seem to be the case in the US? Is there other reasons why people struggle to say I don't know enough here? Anybody want to? Intimidation? Yeah? I agree? Imposter syndrome, definitely. Um, I agree. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I think you're right. I think it's um, a lot of it is imposter syndrome. Anybody else? Um, you touched on it, but um, I think like Taco Bell is a good sense that um, companies want to use server resource if it knows everything about a person. Yeah. Yeah. Companies want you to be a resource, they want you to be the expert. Um, we're going to go into kind of um, the, la the latter part of the talk is going to be how do you deal with those scenarios of where you feel like you should be the expert in something and yet you have to say, I don't know, to somebody. Um, I think we have, yeah. And the fear of looking bad. Mm. Yeah, fear, fear of looking bad, fear of 
maybe being found out for the person that you're, you're afraid that you're not. She's kind of a little bit in the process sometimes as well. Anybody else? This is really interesting for me. Yes? Um, I think there's a sense of competition. You say, I don't know, it's like being weak. weak. Interesting. I've never heard that one before. What was it? Um, co competition. If you, if you say the words, I don't know, then maybe you're, you're afraid of being weak and, and maybe it's elevating somebody else above you or um, de-elevating. Is that a word? It is now, yeah. De-elevating you um, below somebody else. Yeah, I, I think that's true. And um, a lot of the, the, the stuff that I work on is, um, I have a background in software development, but we have psychologists uh, in the company. And one, one of the things that one of the guys, um, Dr. Mike, always talks about is the, um, when you feel like you're going down in that social hierarchy. So humans by nature, you know, we're tribal creatures where, you know, we, where we have hardwired into our biology a hierarchy. Um, and this is why you get really angry when somebody cuts you off in traffic. Because you feel like they're taking your place and that's de-elevated you in front of them. Um, and, you know, when you think back to kind of, uh, you know, primate times, lower down in the food hierarchy is less food, less mates and death. And so when somebody cuts you off in traffic, it, it feeds into our primal um, hind brain of, I'm going to die if I don't get my place back. <laughs> and it's kind of the same with, with this kind of stuff. It's, you know, if we're, if we're reducing ourselves in the work hierarchy, it kind of plays into that, into that same place of, um, you know, if, if, I don't, if I keep dropping down this ladder, eventually I'm going to end up at the bottom. And the bottom is no mates no, and no food. Interesting. Anybody else? Cool. That, that, that's really interesting for me because I think that, that one I've never heard before. Um, and I'm going to see if I can find a way to add that into my talk. So, for me, imposter syndrome is a big one. And when I do this talk in Australia, this is the one that, and this, uh, and this is why this is the next slide. Because this is the one that people mention the most. Um, when we talk about saying I don't know, the, the one that everybody mentions is imposter syndrome. Um, and I think this all goes back to that basing our status on knowledge and not capability. So we, we interview saying I am an Angular expert when we're not, because nobody can be. Um, and then we get found out that we're not. And so one of the things that I encourage everybody to start doing, this is kind of an aside to this talk, but I encourage everybody to start thinking about what they can do rather than what they know, and trying to rephrase phrases such as, I know Angular, into phrases such as, I can build a to-do app in Angular. I can build an e-commerce website in Shopify. Rather than saying the words, I know Shopify, saying, you know, I can build an e-commerce website in Shopify. Because one is a statement of fact, I can build an e-commerce website in Shopify. Another one is, is a statement of assumed knowledge. I know how to use Shopify. One of them can't be proven false. Because if you say, I can build a, a website in Shopify, and you've built in the past a website in Shopify, then it's a statement of fact. If you say, I know Shopify, and it's a statement of assumed knowledge which can be found out as to not be true. So I, in general, one of the ways to, to kind of get around this imposter syndrome is to focus on the things you can do rather than the things that you know. Uh, and, and that was kind of helping your brain to get around the imposter syndrome, if that's something you struggle from. Um, so this is where we want to get to. This is the, the statement, this is the quote that we want to be able to step to say. You know, when somebody says something and, um, you know, we, we don't know the answer to the information, we want to be able to get to the point where we can, we can proudly say that, I don't know the answer to that. You know, I'm an expert in this particular area, but it's, it's not something I know, it's, it's not part of my area of knowledge. Um, and so this, this is the end game of where we want to get to. Um, but, there's a problem with this statement. 
Does anybody want to guess what the problem is? That's definitely a problem. You're not basing your statement on the fact that you're able to gain that knowledge. Yeah. Anybody else? So the statement we have there, and they're both kind of the same thing, is you're, you're basing that statement on the fact that you can actually gain that information. Um, and this, this is the, the, the kind of crux of everything that we're going to talk about from now onwards, is the words I don't know, it's great to be able to say them, but it, it kind of ends the conversation, unless you follow it with something else. There has to be a, a but. I don't know but. And that's how you turn something which can end a conversation, which is the words I don't know, into something that starts a whole new conversation. It's going to be more interesting and more exciting and you know, get, get you engaged and get you interested. I don't know but. I don't know but I know how to find that information. I don't know but I know somebody who is an expert on that. I don't know but. So that's, that's where we're going to go to now. Um, the, the way that you say this, though, has to kind of depend upon the situation you're in. Um, if, you're, if you're a supplier to a client, if you're a leader to your team, there's all different ways in which you can say this. Um, but they all kind of start with that first phrase of, I don't know, but. Um, and so let's, let's kind of go through some of that. So we were talking about an expert there. Um, who knows who Richard Feynman is? Yeah. In Australia, nobody knows. So, um, one of my original career choices, I, I was, uh, when I was 16, 17 years old, kind of choosing what, what I was going to study at university, I was really heavily trying to decide between um, physics and software development. They were my two biggest passions, physics and software development. Uh, and both my uh, high school teachers were trying to convince me to go down the path of their particular chosen subject. Um, and the, the, the two things that decided it for me um, was capability to travel internationally, which both of them had, and ability to learn and earn a lot of money, which only software development had. <laughs> and that is the only reason why I'm still here instead of at a physics uh, lecture down the hall. Um, but Richard Feynman had a, had a great phrase, which is you can spot an expert, a real expert, somebody that really knows what they're talking about, because they'll say the words, I don't know. A phony, somebody that doesn't actually know what they're talking about, will always try and hide the fact that they don't know something. When somebody is really, truly an expert in something, they'll say the words, I don't know. And we kind of pick this up, and I can see a few people nodding. Because they're kind of going, yeah, you know, you can, you can feel that when there's a real expert, you can feel that they, they admit when they don't know something. Um, what I'll add on to Richard Feynman's great quote is that actually, when it's just a real, true expert in something, not only will they say, I don't know, they'll say it happily. There'll be a smile and there'll be an inflection of glee because you've just exposed to them something they can go away and learn. They're excited about the things they don't know. Um, so this, this is something that I encourage everybody to kind of think about and look about and, and you know, try and not hide the areas we don't know. Try and expose them and be happy about them being exposed. Because what that means is it gives you something new to research, something new to go away and discover, something new to have conversations with your friends and colleagues about. And so I love this quote from Richard Feynman. Um, another place where we generally say, I don't know, is in, in talks. So I do a lot of these kinds of talks. And when I first started doing them, um, I did something that I'm not particularly proud of. Um, I used to do talks on technical subjects. I used to do talks on psychology subjects. And sometimes at the end of talks, people would ask me a question. And I bullshit. And I did, I did one of the hardest things that I've ever done in learning to do public speaking. And if you ever do public speaking, I really recommend you do this. And there's a camera over there recording me. 
I'd watch it back. If you ever do public speaking, um, watch it back. It's really hard. Really, really hard to do. But you, you start to realise the things that you do, you start to realise your kind of um, uh, you know, visual body language, you start to realise the things that you say. Uh, the first talk I ever did is actually on YouTube. Um, and I said the word awesome about 20 times in one minute. <laughs> Every time I say the word awesome now, this little flag goes off in my brain that says, how many times have you said that? But one of the things that I noticed I was doing was, um, I was kind of nervous, you know, starting to do public speaking. Um, and I realized that I was, I was starting to, to bullshit in Q&A at the end. Um, and I wasn't happy with it. I was really not proud of myself for doing that. Um, and so I, I made myself, the next time I did a talk, I made myself not bullshit. I made myself say the words I don't know to the person that asked me the question. And actually that was the most interesting Q&A session that i would ever had. Because instead of standing there as a phony expert, I actually had really interesting conversations. I actually learned something. I actually said something tangential that somebody else found really interesting. Because I wasn't trying to control the conversation and I wasn't trying to direct and, and hide the things that I didn't know. By exposing the fact that I didn't know something, I actually had a really, really interesting conversations with people after the talk. And for me, the best Q&As I've ever had after doing public speaking are when it's been a two-way dialogue rather than a monologue of me stood here and talking at you people. Um, and so that's, that's why, you know, at any point during this, if you have a question, if there's something you want to ask, if there's something you want to add, please do so. Yes? What's the YouTube part? part the YouTube? <laughs> <laughs> so um, if you go onto my website, uh, and not, uh, not this one, my personal website, uh, andrewmurphy.io, there's a My Talks section. Um, that's quite an old website, uh, and so the, the talk that's on there now, um, uh, the one that's got a video, that's actually the first talk that I ever did in public, uh, which is at a music group in Melbourne. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit embarrassing. <laughs> so it's not going up on the big screen. <laughs> doing sales meetings early on in my career. Um, I went into, into, the, into this particular sales meeting and the, the, it was my manager and it was me and the client was asking questions or potential client was asking questions and you know I, I would start covering up and I'd start trying to hide and I'd start you know not directly answering the client's questions because I felt like you know, as a, as a supplier to a client, you were there to kind of give this impression that whatever their queries were, you'd already thought about them, you know, there was no issues that they could ever come up with that you'd never thought about before. And this was kind of the idea that I had in my head is that, you know, to, to suppliers, um, sorry, to, to clients as, as a supplier, you had to be this completely infallible expert. Uh, and my boss pulled me to one side and said, stop doing that because the client doesn't expect you to be an expert in everything. They expect you to know what you know and know what you don't know. And by building trust with the client, it gets you into a scenario that where when you say the words, I don't know to them, they respect you and like you and know that you've only got their best interests at heart because if you're bullshitting the clients, then you've not got their best interests at heart. And by, by exposing a lack of knowledge in a particular area, it actually helps build trust with people. Um, there was uh, somebody doing a talk on mentoring yesterday. She, you honest? No. She also had too much conversations with me yesterday. Um, she, uh, 
she, she talked about how exposing your own weaknesses is a way of building trust with people. And it doesn't just apply for that, for that mentor-mentee relationship, it applies for suppliers and clients, it applies for you know, leaders in your team, it applies for everybody around you. Exposing your own weaknesses and, and you know, showing the things um, that you don't know about scenarios um, actually helps. Um, I am running really late. Okay, so suppliers don't expect you to be an expert in everything, they just expect you um, to, to know how to find that information out. And these are kind of some of those phrases I was talking about earlier, which are the things that we can say, where we say, I don't know, and it doesn't end the conversation. It continues the conversation. And if you notice, they've all got that word, but, in them. Um, because it's always, I don't know, but. I don't know, but, I know someone who might, I'll get back to you. I don't know, but let's work through some ideas together. These, these are phrases we can use that you know show the client that you don't know, but you're willing to work with them, to work with other people to find this information out. Um, so these are some great phrases for things like that. Another area is lead us to the people below us. Um, and personally for me, a lot of the work that I do is working with leaders in technology. And this is one huge area, which I think, uh, as an industry, we can spend a lot of time working on, which is a lot of technical leaders, and myself included when I first started leading technical teams, think we have to know more than everybody else in our team combined. I was doing some training with um, Australia Post, which is the equivalent of uh, USPS, um, and they, there was this guy who just started heading up their AWS infrastructure at Australia Post. Um, and I, sat, I was mentoring him and I, I sat down with him and he was telling me about how for the last six months since he'd been promoted to being a leader, he was spending every evening and weekend reading AWS documentation. And he said the words to me, I don't know why my girlfriend is still with me. Oh guy. And it was because he, he had this idea in his head that being a leader of a team meant that you had to have the answer to every question they could possibly ask. That you had to be the, the, the nexus of all the knowledge rather than empowering the team to find the information out. And that mindset is what leads to an inability to say, I don't know as a leader. When what we should be doing is we should be encouraging people um, to find the information out for themselves. We should be encouraging people to work together to find information. So we, we should be saying things like, I don't know, do you? you know, I don't know, can you help me find out? Or, you no, know, I don't know, but Jessica does. And spreading this information around in the team. Um, because being that one person at the top that knows everything is death to a team and death to you as a leader. I, I, I know, because I, I was that leader early on in my career. This is a, a great quote from um, the CEO of Etsy. Um, in order to have a great company, you have to admit when you don't know something. An overly self-confident leader is the worst kind of leader. It's okay to admit if you don't have an answer. The key is to build a team that does. I think, for me, that kind of sets out the type of team that I want to build. You know, when I'm working with companies to help them structure the, the, their teams and structure their leaders and find the right people to promote to, leader, uh, to leadership and then build the great teams. It's that kind of mindset of, I don't need to be the expert, but I'm going to build a team under me that knows how to find the answer. Um, so to me, that's kind of the crux of leadership. And if that's, if that's who you can be as a leader, then it's fine to say the words I don't know to me. So, kind of, coming to a little bit of a, of a conclusion and then we can have a bit of a, a Q&A and a conversation. Uh, my voice is getting a little bit sore. How can you help yourself? How can this be something that you get into your daily life, into something which you can focus on and habits you can change and ways you can rephrase what you're saying?
I don't know. I know what works for me. For me, I've spent enough time saying these words that I'm not afraid of them anymore. Um, it's something I, I've worked on for a long, long time. In some of my stories, you, you've probably got an idea of the kind of guy that I was 10 years ago. The kind of guy that was bullshitting at the end of talks and bullshitting to clients and saying things that he didn't know. Um, and it was doing things like having my boss come to me and, and tell me, stop doing that. It was watching myself do it, what we call it on video, that kind of kick-started me into realizing that I was doing these things. But I, I'd love to, I'd love to um, for the time we have left, how much time do we have left? Is it seven, seven minutes? So in the last seven minutes, I'd love to, to kind of share some stories from you guys to the group about the times when you said, I don't know to somebody, and it went really well. Or times when you said it, and it went really badly. I'd love to kind of talk about that and, and have a bit of a conversation. So does anybody that wants to share a story of the time when I said it and it went really well? Or really badly? Yeah. Especially with our Stack Overflow or Google. Yeah, and on a whiteboard or yeah. kind of duck. I, I agree. And, and actually, interestingly, um, when I'm working with companies to kind of help their recruitment processes, one of the things that I always recommend is to try and get the candidate into a scenario where they say, I don't know. Because it's always interesting to find out what the way candidates deal with that. Um, and, you know, ma making sure that beforehand you've said something like, you know, look, we don't expect you to know the answers to all of these questions. You know, we're, we're just trying to gauge where your knowledge level is at. To kind of let them know that, it, it, you know, subconsciously it's okay to say, I don't know. But then it's always interesting to kind of find out what candidates do in interview situations when you, um, you know, put them in a situation where you know they don't know. Um, yeah. I think that um, leadership and I think that's something, you know, if there are there any technical leaders, people have teams. Yeah, I, I think this is one of the things that we can, we can really work on as technical leaders is to help the people under us feel comfortable saying, I don't know. And a lot of that comes from saying it ourselves. You know, people replicate the behavior of um, their leaders. And so if we can say, I don't know, then that's easy. Um, it's interesting, when you look at all the research of why people leave jobs, Predominantly, people don't leave companies. People leave managers. People will say and stay in a bad company with a good manager, but they won't stay in a good company with a bad manager. Anyone else wants to share? I was going to say, thinking back actually on both of those statements, whenever I interview somebody, I can see when I start saying something technical, I start to see the white in their eyes. I'm like, 
an I don't know is an acceptable answer. <laughs> you really? Just tell me, and then we're good. <laughs> so, because I, I think when I ask for one of those questions, I'm not looking for the technical, I'm looking, do you know, like, no, I don't know, but I'll Google it. Like, good, okay, at least I know that you're willing to take that. Yeah, yeah. So. And, and then you can see what they Google food like. Well. Yes. <laughs> How good are you? <laughs> Yes. Uh, when I was on my first internship with software, uh, every week we would go into a big conference room and engineers and insurance would share a program. Not a great program, but there was one person coding and we passed the computer around. And this time I didn't know Ruby on Rails so well, and uh, I just had no idea what we were trying to build. And they were like, all right, your turn, three minutes for building this API or something. And I just totally like made up what, what I was supposed to be doing. But, um, and I did not say I don't know. And how did I go? Now, I, I don't think really like it. <laughs> <laughs> you've been, you've been <laughs> the memory. I don't think you do something that's added inside. That's the memory of the next person. That's when you just start refactoring the code. You don't know what it does, but you can refactor it. I think I started questioning everything that happened before me as if I was like comparing. <laughs> Yeah. And the further the conversation goes, the harder it is to say, I don't know. Because the, the, the fact is that then everybody's going, well, why didn't you say that 10 minutes ago? So it's, it's always easier to say, I don't know, earlier in the conversation than it is later. And the, the further, it's, it's like waterfall methodology. The further you are down, the harder it is to go back. Anybody else? that I always try to do if it works really well is like, instead of just saying I don't know, say like, we will get through this together and build a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is, and that kind of mutual understanding of, you know, this is a problem that can be solved, and we're going to do it together. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, I got my job because I said I didn't need to. Um, I was I, I love those kinds of stories because it shows you the fact that you know people, I, I generally work on the principle that most people are good people. Um, and you know, there are exceptions to that rule, but I'd rather work on, on the principle of assuming that everybody's good until proven otherwise. And you know, just being able to be open to people and being able to open up to them and admit when we don't know things is, is a way of building that trust and that respect. Um, Okay, so we've just about come to the end. Um, really encourage you guys to think about these things, have conversations with each other, and really spend the time having conversations about this. Whenever you're in your team, whenever you're working with people, just try and say this as much as possible. Whenever it's valid, just say it, because that's how we can reduce this cognitive power that it has over us, is just by saying it every goddamn time. Thank you.